Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. At the end of the day, it's all about the patient. That's what medicine is about. It's not about the team. It's about the patient. And if you don't elevate that patient voice, if you're not listening to that patient voice, then it doesn't matter if you have the greatest treatment. The treatment only matters if the patient tells you that everything that's impacting them by IBD gets better. Welcome to The Health Advocates, a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all. I'm Stephen Newmark, Director of Policy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And I'm Zoe Rothblatt, Associate Director of Community Outreach at GHLF. Our goal is to help you understand what's happening in the healthcare world, to help you make informed decisions to live your best life. But before we get started, we want to be sure that everyone takes a listen to all of GHLF's great podcasts. We have so many to choose from. We sure do. As a reminder, you can check them all out at ghlf.org slash listen. This week, we'll give a shout out to Healthcare Matters. Our colleagues, Connor and Robert, do a deeper dive on policy issues, and they are back for season three. So definitely check it out. Excellent. I know I will be checking it out for sure. For sure. And let's check out a listener comment. Are you ready, Stephen? I am ready. This one is from Teresa Kay, who wrote, you guys do such a great job at breaking down the weekly news. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, We do what we can, and um, we'll continue doing it as long as you keep listening. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, Stephen, this week, I'm really excited for you to hear the interview I had with Dr. Neil Nandi. He's a gastroenterologist specializing in inflammatory bowel disease, and I just had a really wonderful conversation with him about how he advocates for patients, how patients are partner in care, and the importance of reducing disparities, especially when it comes to IBD. So I'm really excited for you and our listeners to hear it. I'm excited too. As someone who's gone through the IBD patient journey, I'm excited to hear what Dr. Nandy says. Awesome. So shall we dive into the news? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Well, this first bit of news is causing a bit of uproar. President Biden said that the pandemic is over. What are your thoughts here? (laughs) That's right. So earlier this week on 60 Minutes, President Biden said the pandemic is over. To be fair, the full statement was the pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it, but the pandemic is over. Of course, as many have pointed out, 400 people a day are still dying of COVID. That certainly doesn't feel like the end of a pandemic. Also, what we pointed out in our last episode, um, we sort of just did a recap of the landscape of what's going on and whether or not it feels like you know COVID is still a threat. And I think the consensus you and I came to is that it is like multiple times a day, we're thinking about it, planning around it. Um, you know, it really is a big part of our life. I know after this statement was said by the president, so many people in our community started, you know, direct messaging us on social media saying, have you heard about this? You know, we don't feel safe. This is a bit scary for us to hear someone in a leadership position declare it over. We're still feeling left behind in general. And this is kind of making it worse for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, And I would agree with that sentiment just from a political calculation. When the president says that the pandemic is over, that is going to make it hard for that president to then ask for funding to help deal with COVID in the future. So that is problematic. But getting back to the idea of is the pandemic over, when when is the pandemic going to be over? I mean, certainly in March of 2020, that was the first question. When is this going to be over? When is this going to be over? And it just kept hitting us. When is this going to be over? And I feel as though we went through several stages. In the early days, there was this vision of it being over. Oh, we're all going to go on lockdown and eventually it'll go away. Right. Two weeks to flatten the curve. Right. To flatten the curve. Remember that? Oh, boy. Then there was a phase where we thought, well, if enough people get vaccinated, we still might be able to get to herd immunity and essentially kind of stop the virus from from spreading too much. And uh, that might be the end of the pandemic. Then that became impossible. So we sort of got to this next phase where we believed that the virus could circulate, but we sort of thought maybe it'll be like other coronaviruses that cause colds or, you know, or something, even the flu. However, I feel as though we've reached this situation where COVID is actually worse than the flu. It's not like, you know, sometimes we joke around here and say it's like a second flu, but it it is worse. I mean, 400 deaths a day for COVID is not akin to the flu. Yeah. So I actually, you know, thinking about that, I think we're in the same line of thought because I looked up what are annual deaths in the U.S. for a number of things. And, you know, when you look at COVID, there's been 1 million deaths just this year. Right. And the flu over the past couple of years, data from the CDC 
CDC shows that we expect 12,000 to 52,000 deaths annually. From the flu. So that's quite a difference. That's not comparable. Yeah. And when you think about a few other things that are really prevalent in our life, we get in a car every day. So I was curious, you know, how many car accidents are happening? The CDC says less than 40,000. You know, gun control has been a really big conversation. How many, um, you know, gun related deaths are there? Less than 40,000. Cancer around 600,000 each year. And when you think that COVID is, you know, a million just this past year, it really is still a looming issue. Yeah. I also was looking up some numbers and uh, there was an estimate that Omicron over the past several months has infected 80% of the US population. So by contrast, I was looking at this, the flu sickens an estimated 10 to 20% of Americans annually. That's a big difference. Like from 80 to 10 to 20 is... Yeah. In a really bad year, the flu could infect as many as 50%. And going forward, there's a hope that COVID would get to 50%. But certainly there's a disparity because one for flu, it's at the very high end, whereas for COVID, that would be at the very low end. So yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Flu is, I guess, kind of what you would call endemic in a public health term. You know, it's it's disease that's usually present in the community. And it's, it's not necessarily desired, but it's like, that's the observed level. We expect this amount of flu each year. And, you know, I was wondering, you know, is COVID endemic? Are we at that level? And it's kind of interesting because when you look that up, it's experts say, you know, there's no accepted metrics or defined international rules that tell us when it gets to that point. Yeah, I don't have an answer. So let's take it out of public health and academia. There's just um, when there's a feeling of normalcy with COVID, if you will, I think that's when the pandemic is over, at least the official pandemic, and you're down to an endemic situation. And I think certainly that feeling is widespread, whether whether you and I share that feeling and others in the chronically ill community share that feeling, that's certainly the prevalent feeling in the world. Now, I think that we're aware of COVID. Someone like myself still wears an N95 mask when I'm indoors with people I don't know, you know, in a supermarket or I'm traveling on public transportation or airlines. A lot of others don't. But my point is it hasn't stopped me. It hasn't curtailed me from doing much of anything lately. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, that just got me thinking as, you know, we're the health advocates and people were upset by this statement. So what can you do? You know, you can always call your local elected officials and talk to them about where you feel safe or where not and what's going on with COVID and ask for more awareness and precautions around it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I again, I know that this depends where you live, but I've been flying recently. Very few folks have masks, but I feel as though it's totally socially acceptable for me to be wearing a mask, you know? And it, so I think that the more we continue to allow policymakers, people in certain positions to understand that the pandemic or endemic, whatever we want to call it, is continuing for folks who are chronically ill, the more folks that know that, the better. 100%. And I think like a lot of this is touching on on the mental health aspect and another interesting piece of news. I saw a health panel recommends that U.S. adults should get routine anxiety screening. Yeah. So this is the first time uh, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has recommended anxiety screening and primary care for adults without symptoms. And the proposal is open for public comment until later in October. So, you know, it's not an official rule yet, but we're expected that it should become one. What does that mean, anxiety screening? in primary care? Does that mean when you have a, a well visit with your primary care doctor, there's a screening, like a set of questions that they ask? Or That's what I would assume. Just like how I guess, you know, you screen for other diseases in your primary care, you know, you get blood work, you check your cholesterol, diabetes, like blood sugar, things like that. Now, I would assume there's also a mental component where they ask certain questions and then are able to refer you to the appropriate care. Yeah, absolutely. I would advocate for that regardless of what the U.S. prevented services task force says. Uh, I don't see any downside to discussing that with your primary care physician. I think that's actually an important point. Like sometimes it's really hard to bring things up like mental health and especially in a doctor visit that could only be like 10 minutes. And sometimes you don't even get the opportunity to speak like any of your talking points, let alone to bring up something like a little emotional. It helps to break that ice if the provider starts that conversation.
recommendation. Yeah, and I would say one other thing is it also breaks the ice if there actually is a recommendation from something like this, or you see a news article mentioning it. It's definitely an icebreaker. Hey, I saw this news article in XYZ. As a side note, I saw a news article about a cure for baldness that dermatologists are using. And I'm like, well, now I could bring that up with my dermatologist. <laughs> well, we're all about shared decision making. I, there's so many times I've like printed out stuff and brought it to my doctor and talked about it. Okay, Stephen, that wraps up our news segment. And like I mentioned, I spoke with Dr. Nandi, who is an academic gastroenterologist specializing in inflammatory bowel disease. And he's here today to talk to us about how he advocates for patients and the importance of minimizing disparities in IVD care. Welcome to the Health Advocates. Thanks for having me, Zoe. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, would you like to kick it off by introducing yourself and give a snapshot of what you do and things you're involved in? Sure. My name is Neil Nandi. I'm a physician specializing in inflammatory bowel disease, the care of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis at the University of Pennsylvania. A lot of my work is in physician uh, awareness and education and also patient health advocacy in the IBD space. I am a proud member of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the United Ostomy Associates of America. And in those organizations, I've been very blessed to conduct a lot of patient and clinician-directed education. And most recently, I've been focusing on raising awareness about inflammatory bowel disease, which is on the rise in South Asian patients of descent. So tell me about that. It's on the rise. Was it always there and we just didn't know about it? Or is it really you know, on the rise recently? What's going on there? Yeah, you know, this is a fascinating story, actually. Uh, my father had Crohn's and uh, that was in the 1970s, early 1970s. And at that time, his inflammation, the physicians here in, in, in the US were like, your people don't get Crohn's. What are you talking about this? But ultimately he was diagnosed with that, was responsible to steroids only, of course. And what we've seen decade after decade where IBD was once not very prevalent in South Asia itself, we've seen increasing prevalence of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in South Asia and in descendants of South Asian immigrants across the globe. Um, so we see this increase and it's, it's South Asians and it's also pretty much other ethnic groups were seeing um, an increase as well. And we don't know why, but we believe there's an environmental trigger that's potentiating this. We don't think that it's over our better diagnosis. We don't think certainly they were being missed, but we think there's an environmental trigger leading to an increased prevalence. And if this is a group that, you know, historically hasn't been diagnosed with IBD and now is, what does that mean for, you know, diagnosis rates, access to treatment, things like that? Are, are people getting the care that they need? Well, in short, the answer is no. Now, the ramifications of getting a chronic illness diagnosis are multifold, right? Um, not just the physical and emotional, but the mental, and then also the cultural stigma that one individually perceives, that one the family unit perceives and fears, right? Because it's stigmatized. When it comes to South Asian culture, and this is not unique just to South Asians, but it's a particularly severe impact it can have, which is negative. Meaning if you have Crohn's or colitis, or gosh forbid, you need surgery or diverting ostomy for perianal fistulizing disease, right? Now it affects uh, one's self-esteem, but also marriageability, how others may perceive you in marriage um, in terms of not just finding a partner, but also childbearing, you know, or, or fathering a child, right? Depending on your role. So the cultural aspect can also impact what, what treatments you might accept, you know, not just accepting the disease state as true, but whether you would accept a traditional Western med versus a complementary alternative medical therapy, um, like Ayurvedic medicine or herbals or other supplementation. So lots of different ramifications there that inhibit acceptance and prevent early treatment, early access. And what kinds of things do you tell your patients when they come to you with these concerns? I mean, if they even do at all, it's obviously very emotional um, subject to bring up and sometimes challenging, but how do you help patients advocate for themselves in their everyday life? Yeah. So honestly, even with South Asians, my, my message is, is, is true, just regardless of your skin color, ethnic background. You know, one is uh, you should always, you know, have some faith in your doctor, but that, that faith has to be earned. And if you, if you don't feel that that is happening or your physician or nurse practitioner or PA is going above and beyond to educate you, teach you, help you understand why decisions are being made, then, then, then there's an educational gap there. So I always say, arm yourself with education, learn, read, 
and ask questions. I think patients more than ever have to feel empowered that it is okay and right to ask questions. You should trust your clinician, but that is learning. And the way you have the clinician earn your trust as a patient is ask the right questions and be satisfied with the time and clarity of the explanation they take in making it to you. And if you don't have that, then there's something awry in your care. Now, finding the right sources of education, that can be a very challenging matter with all the misinformation there is out there, right? Yeah, it's really hard navigating a new diagnosis and going to Google and just being bombarded with information. That's right. You know, so that's why, you know, I think we recognize more than ever that with social media being an, another media distribution outlet, right? We had radio, we got TV, we got internet, but social is its own beast that information and misinformation can propagate. You know, in this day and age, we have more misinformation than ever on social media. And so several organizations have risen to the challenge. So the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, uh, ccfa.org, has wonderful information. You all, your organization, has some great links to articles and podcasts on, on the concept. I, I've perused the materials, of course. And then we also need to recognize that inflammatory bowel disease education has to be tailored uh, towards one's culture and ethnic background and health literacy, of course, right? And so there's several different organizations that are trying to do that. Our organization that we founded, the South Asian IBD Alliance, SIA, can be found at southasianibd.org. We're actually a physician and patient collaborative. We work together. Our board is docs, uh, dietitians, gut psychologists, and patient advocates, most importantly, that help drive our educational mission. And we actually have a patient advocacy arm known as IBD DACES. DACE is the word for someone of South Asia, and it's IBD, one D as in David, ESI. So that's our, uh, we have IBD DACES and South Asian IBD Alliance. We work together. We do monthly patient webinars where we have clinicians and patients on a panel and then open a live Q&A. And by doing so, we try to normalize the conversation on IBD. We try to provide good, solid, trustworthy education and then be a trusted resource for open question and answer. So that's been our approach in SIA. And then we also try to make the information culturally appropriate. Uh, our diet differs from the standard American diet. And so we talk about diet and IBD from a South Asian lens. And similarly, we approach Western medicines like biologics and immunosuppressants through the lens of a South Asian physician and patient rather than just how we practice in the West alone. So much of what I'm hearing from you is that patients really do have a seat at the table and are a partner in care. And I think that it's so important for people in our community to hear that because so often people have had doctors not believe in them, especially with something like IBD, which is such a personal condition to live with. I think it's so powerful to hear from you that you're listening to patients, you're pulling them in the conversation, you're putting them in leadership positions and saying, you know, it really is all about the patient at the end of the day. And that's it. At the end of the day, it's all about the patient. That's what medicine is about. It's not about the team. It's about the patient and the team serves the patient. This is the standard of care. And if you don't elevate that patient voice, if you're not listening to that patient voice, then it doesn't matter if you have the greatest treatment. The treatment only matters if the patient tells you that everything that's impacting them by IBD gets better right? So we have this new new philosophy, if you will, called patient reported outcomes or PROs. These are actually outcomes that we look for in clinical trials. It used to be that when we give a patient a medicine in IBD, we look to see the decrease in bowel movements and we do scopes on them and make sure that the intestinal lining, the mucosa has healed. Those are very important. But we were always failing to ask, how has the IBD affected your quality of life? And have those things gotten better? And many times we were missing the mark. That's unacceptable. Yeah, the labs can only tell so much of the story. There's a lot there that patients are experiencing. And it's so important to take into consideration things like patient reported outcomes, because it is your quality of life and your everyday life. And if you can't participate meaningfully in your daily activities, that's not okay. You know, we need to figure out a better plan. That's exactly right. You know, before we go, I wanted to ask you about your podcast. You host GI Insights IBD Crosstalk. Tell us about that podcast and the types of discussions you have there. I'm very, very fortunate to be the host of that podcast. It's sponsored by ReachMD, which is a CME company. And they've given me a platform to invite cutting edge guests 
to talk about cutting edge topics. And it's called Crosstalk because we try to talk about interdisciplinary things, the cross section of rheumatologic and dermatologic, but also how do we use x-rays? How do we use intestinal ultrasound? How do we use virtual reality as digital therapeutic? How do we think outside the box? So I try to pull on different disciplines rather than just gastroenterologists alone and talk about all these different facets that impact the care of the IBD patient. It's geared towards an audience of, of physicians uh, and medical professionals, but we have a lot of patients who listen to it too. And I think that's great because patients should not be excluded from the level of conversation that we have as clinicians. And yeah, I think it helps so much to say it's open to everyone. Try and listen if you like it, be your own advocate. And it sounds like you're helping your colleagues be the best advocates they can be for patients as well. So thank you for all you do. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Wow, Zoe, that was a really great interview. Thank you. Yeah, we learned a lot. And speaking of learnings, uh, Stephen, that brings us to the close of our show. What did you learn today? Well, I learned from you about the various specific numbers that afflict deaths in the U.S. when it comes to COVID, flu, car accidents, and the comparison I found to be quite illuminating. And I learned from Dr. Nandi just how important patients play a role in their care and how, you know, through the lens of a provider, it really does help when patients are speaking up and advocating. We'd love to hear from you about your advocacy stories. Send your email to thehealthadvocates at ghlf.org, or better yet, include a short video or audio clip. And who knows, whatever you share may be included in our listener feedback portion of future episodes. Also email us if you want to subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we share the top health news of the week. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to The Health Advocates, a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all. If you like this episode, give us a rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. It'll help more people like you find us. I'm Zoe Rothblatt. I'm Stephen Newmark. We'll see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Thank you.